True or false? The real obstacle to drug access is poverty. My friend, this is a health economist, but my friend Tom Pogge, what does he tell me? I love Tom, he's my good straw man. The most significant determinant of avoidable death is poverty, Tom tells me. But look at my correlation coefficient. I only explained half the cases in South Africa, fairly weak. This is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? So it's not just poverty. What else is happening? Let's look. Well, let's look at the domestic politics, not just the economics. You see, well, there, this is why you got to just don't listen to the economists. I mean, I love economists, but you got to look past them because they say things like, well, poverty or something economic must be behind it. There's domestic politics. And the question is, what does GCS do when there's government failure, like AIDS denialism in South Africa, right? Uh, Mbeki's famous AIDS denialism and the underprovision of public goods. Well, then we go back to this. You can lobby governments. You can boycott governments. Harder to do when they're democratic. I haven't heard of one um, global civil society group willing to boycott the South African government, democratically elected, politically incorrect. These are difficult strategies. And the second best solution has been to pressure boycott local firms like to provide employees with ARVs, so like the boycott of Coca-Cola in South Africa. So here again, global civil society, it's not stupid. These guys are really smart. Why do we go after multinational firms? Because then we put pressure on the firms in the hope that they'll either provide the public good directly, so they'll provide ARVs to all their employees, and they'll then go lobby government. Why will they do that? Because firms don't like being put at a competitive disadvantage. So Coke's being targeted. It's got to provide ARVs, but Pepsi isn't. So then Coke says to the South African government, you've got to level the playing field for us here. So this is the GCS strategy when it comes to corporate social responsibility and attacking it. But I suggest that they should also focus on something I don't think they've done that well, building local NGO capacity. Let me show you why I say that. OK, so they've had a strategy, lobby governments, attack firms, but they focus less on something that might be more useful, building local NGO capacity. Here is um, Global Civil Society actually does support the treatment action campaign in South Africa, but with mixed effects, because we see the take-up rate in South Africa is very low. Now, why? Uh, first is. Pressure on firms may not work too well over the long haul. I'm on the board of one of the biggest sustainable, uh, sustainability funds in the world. It's run by the FTSE, the London Stock Exchange uh, Financial Times joint venture. And I just charted uh, our performance, uh, which is down here, versus the FTSE 100. This is how good companies do compared to bad companies. Dow Jones has a sustainability index. We find the same thing. Good companies don't do as well as bad companies. But we'd expect that because we're imposing costs on these guys. If they're in reasonably competitive industries, it's hard for them to sustain those costs. Okay? So this might be a tough strategy to sustain, this pressure on the firms. That's why I say maybe you want to build local NGO capacity. Now look at this. This is my favorite slide. I had this idea to map NGO density in sub-Saharan African countries versus the ARV take-up rate. And I have a correlation coefficient of 83. I haven't done any regression analysis. All this could wash out in regressions, OK? But for the students back there, before you do regressions, make pictures. You heard it from Professor Kapstein. I don't care what your professors tell you here. Before you do regressions, make pictures. OK? Make pictures. The only other guys I know who tell their students that are Jim Robinson and Darren Asselmaglou, and they're the best in the business. If they tell their students to do it, it's a good thing to follow. Those guys are tough. So I had this idea of looking at NGO density within the sub-Saharan African countries versus ARV take-up. That's looking intriguing to me. It's, uh, so what you do, I don't know how good this data, this, this 
data set comes from the London School of Economics. Um, and they say the data comes from the UN, which uh, looks at people's involvement in non-governmental organization. They poll people and ask, are you involved in civil society groups, so on and so forth. It's not clear to me, Arish, whether religious groups are included or what types of religion, religious groups are included or not included. Okay? So I don't, you know, but this just struck me as intriguing, right? Because everybody tells me, like Tom Pogge, like uh, Owen Lippert, it's poverty. So throw money at poor countries. Another interesting thing. Vincent, yes, sir. Before you move off, yeah. I mean, one of the nice things about pictures is that they show you whether you've got data or anecdotes. It looks to me like you've got anecdotes about two countries. Yeah. You, you don't have a pattern. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, you know, I haven't, what I have to do, Steve, is run a regression eventually to see if anything is important. Because when. To eliminate those outliers, your relationship with Yeah, yeah, well, you have to do a nice regression, and then you have to ask, do I eliminate the outliers and all this stuff, and, you know, this might go away. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with this, having just finished this democracy book. Oi, I'm very familiar. Although you are sort of trying to play both sides of the street, since you've got a regression running again. Yeah. Yeah, well, I just, you know, because to me it's for future, this is work in progress. Yeah. I guess you've probably figured that out by now. Uh, I know that's dangerous to present uh, for kind of a job talk, but, you know, I'm excited by it, so this is what I'm pursuing. You should know what you're going to have to live with if you come here. What? Moving to case studies of those two countries might tell you a lot well, right. about what works. So that's why, you know, my own work has tended to combine the kind of modeling with data with the case studies. And that's what we do in a democracy book, which I'm so proud of, because we really have statistical, descriptive statistics, multivariate regression, and then case studies. Because I think you've got to put it together. I'm convinced now you've got to put them together. Any one of them, you're going to miss a big part of the picture. So, but for me, this is the first time I've ever seen anyone think about this relationship, that this might matter, that how much, you know. So maybe it doesn't, but it's worth, I think, taking another look. That's all. Um, now here's something, you know, here's with the descriptive statistics. Um, Evan Lieberman at Princeton has just published a study where he finds a very strong effect of the take, uh, ARV take-up rate and ethno-linguistic fragmentation. You see, I don't find it, but I went to his, I found this the night before I left <laughs> to come here, and I panic, go to his website, and he has another data set. So I can't replicate, so all I do is take the ELF data that I have on my own data set and put it across here. I don't find a strong relationship, but he does. He finds a very strong relation. Uh, and that, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to that argument because we find that countries with very high levels of ethno-linguistic fragmentation tend not to do well on a number of levels. They do under-provide public goods. So for example, like I have mapped infant mortality and levels of education against ethno-linguistic fragmentation. Okay, so maybe it's harder to build civil society, build domestic uh, civil capacity when you have very divided societies. You can look at Kenya today; would be an example. 